You are listening to Veggie Doctor Radio, and this is episode number 129. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am your host, Dr. Yami, board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, certified health and wellness coach, author, speaker, mother, wife, and human being. I passionately believe in the power of diet, habits, and mindset in sparking and sustaining well being and joy in our lives. This podcast combines expert interviews and thoughtful monologues to explore plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, parenting, mindset, and other exciting and fun topics. I hope that these episodes inspire you, uplift you, and equip you with the knowledge and tools to live your best life. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. If they simply write down the question, what is the, the most important thing I need to do today? And just write it somewhere and put it up where they see it every day. The question stays the same, but the answers change. Veggie lovers unite. Welcome back. It's Sunday and you are in for a treat because I have a little something different for you today. An interview with Greg McEwen, who is the author of the book, Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less. This is actually one of my dream guests because I read his book a couple years ago, maybe even three years now. It's been a few years and it it was just, uh, just perfect at the time of my life to read the concepts in this book. And little by little, I've been trying to lead a more essentialist life, but I can't say that I consider myself an essentialist yet because I am probably the poster child of non-essentialism. I've been trained like that since I was little, and I love doing everything and anything that sounds fun and exciting under the sun, but sometimes that leads to consequences. In this conversation, you're going to hear about what essentialism is, why you may want to consider learning more about it and starting to practice some of the principles. But before I tell you more about Greg McEwen, don't forget that I have lots of freebies on my website growing every day, dryami.com forward slash free. So there you can find guides on replacing meat, replacing dairy, breakfast, lunch, plant-based shopping lists, supplement guides, all kinds of things. You can download one, you can download them all. So that's dryami.com, all spelled out, D-O-C-T-O-R-Y-A-M-I.com forward slash free. And also don't forget that I have a book. So for those of you that have already read it and left me a review, thank you so much. If you haven't already checked out my book, it's available in ebook, paperback, and audiobook. It's called A Parent's Guide to Intuitive Eating, How to Raise Kids Who Love to Eat Healthy. And it's written for parents that have children of all ages or grandparents or aunts and uncles, anybody that helps feed children or even people that are feeding themselves, which is most people. You can learn from my book, not just about plant-based nutrition, but how to approach eating, how to approach feeding and how to make it less stressful, more joyful for your entire family. So check it out. A Parent's Guide to Intuitive Eating, How to Raise Kids Who Love to Eat Healthy. Thank you so much, Courtney McDermott, for leaving this review on Apple Podcasts entitled, Love Everything About This Pod. Wonderful and helpful information and tips for new vegans and veterans. There's no way you can't go plant-based after listening to these episodes. Each episode is fun to listen to. She is a breath of fresh air. I wish she could be my small toddler's pediatrician. Aw, thank you so much, Courtney. I appreciate that review. And I wish I could be everybody's doctor too. It's really fun to be a pediatrician and children are the best. They're so adorable. Remember that the information on this podcast is for informational and educational purposes only. However, in this episode, we really don't talk about food or nutrition or any of that kind of stuff. We talk about some bigger concepts about how we can lead our lives in a way that 
gives us more output, more meaning, more purpose, and less of the doing part. Okay. So you'll get it when you listen more, but let me tell you about Greg McEwen. He is originally from London, England. You'll find that out soon and is the author of a New York times bestseller called essentialism, the disciplined pursuit of less. He's also the founder of McEwen Inc, a company with a mission to teach essentialism to millions of people around the world. Their clients include Adobe, Apple, Airbnb, Cisco, Google, Facebook, Pixar, Salesforce.com, Symantec, Twitter, VMware, and Yahoo. He is an accomplished public speaker and has spoken to hundreds of audiences around the world, including Australia, Bulgaria, Canada, China, England, Holland, India, Ireland, Italy, Japan, Norway, and lots more, including the United States, of course. His writing has appeared or has been covered by Fast Company, Fortune, HuffPost, Politico, and Inc. Magazine, and the Harvard Business Review. He's also been interviewed on numerous television and radio shows, including NPR and NBC. In 2012, he was named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum, and originally he's from London, England, but he now lives in the Los Angeles area with his wife and their four children. He graduated with an MBA from Stanford University. And you will see that he's very humble and he's very authentic. And really, he just wants to help everybody feel better in their lives. Basically, you know, it comes down to that. It's about how can we feel better? How can we have more well being? How can we have more meaning and purpose? and not run ourselves into the ground with exhaustion and burnout. And what I see in my office, which is anxiety and depression and all of these things. And also we talk about how we can start talking to our children about these decisions. Do you feel like your children are overscheduled? Do you feel like they have too many activities? They're not getting enough sleep. They're stressed out all the time. So then maybe you need to read Essentialism together as a family and start talking about the concepts and how you can each apply them to your lives, how important that would be. How do you want to feel? What do you want to be part of your life at the end of the day? So we talk about that. We talk about schooling and where, you know, where, um, how school was developed during the industrial revolution and thinking of different ways of that. We talk about play. We talk about editing. Um, So lots of great concepts that are covered in this episode. I know it's a little different, but you know that I like to bring you things that have helped me and have impacted me, even though I'm not perfect at them. I'm not telling you I'm perfect because I'm not, and you know me very well. But this concept has the potential to really change your life for the better. So please pay attention, take notes, and get yourself a copy of Essentialism and read it before his next book comes out, which is called Effortless, which comes out in 2021. Thank you so much for being here today, veggie lovers. I hope you love this episode. Let me know what you think. And now on to the episode. Well, I have Mr. Greg McEwen here with me today. This is so exciting for me because I first read your book, Essentialism, about two years ago on a camping trip, and I decided I was going to completely change my life and become an essentialist. I've had to read it a couple more times and listen to the audiobook since that very first time. And really, I just want you to know I tricked you into doing this episode, really, it's going to be a counseling session for me to learn how to become an essentialist, but hopefully it will also help other people. So Greg McEwen, welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. Yami, it's so good to be with you. And uh, and you, we're in the right place. I don't know if you know this, but on on the uh, on my podcast, basically, that's what I do is essentialism interventions. So, nice. So that's what we're, we're, we're you're in good company. We just right. take so we're somebody just, and yeah. apply it. It's going to reverse it here on my podcast. That's what we're going to do. But for all of the people who have not yet had the opportunity to read your book, it's just, it's so fabulous. And the reason I've read it so many times is because I think it is applicable. And I do want to admit I have 
been able to apply some of the strategies, but I don't consider myself an essentialist quite yet. But can you tell us what is essentialism and how did you discover it? Uh, essentialism is really simple. It's like the simplest idea in the world. You are focusing on what is essential instead of what's non-essential. You're eliminating the non-essential from your life as much as possible. And then you're building a system to make it as routine and easy as possible to do in the future. Mm -hmm. That's essentialism. That's the process. And it's just to keep doing that every day until you find that your life is centered in the things that really matter most, uh, instead of being dragged into all of the reactive, distracting, but trivial uh, behaviors that can easily consume our lives uh, if we're not careful. That's what essentialism is. Yes. And you were able to come upon essential, essentialism because you had an experience. You weren't just born naturally an essentialist, right? So tell us a little bit what happened that key moment when you were like, all right, something's got to change here. Yes. In hindsight, it was when I received an email uh, from my manager at the time and it said Friday between one and two uh, would be a very bad time for your wife to have a baby <laughs> uh, because I need you to be at this client meeting. And um, I mean, my wife, Anna, was expecting. Otherwise, you know, that's an even stranger email to receive. Um, but there we are. Uh, in Thursday night, we go into the hospital and our daughter's born in the early hours of Friday morning. And instead of being focused on that clearly essential moment, instead of being able to enjoy it, instead of being able to relax in it and just, just be there for my wife and be there for my daughter, I'm feeling torn and pulled and I've got my laptop out and I'm, I'm, I'm reacting still and I'm trying to work out, look, how can I fit it all in? Uh, because then I'll keep everybody happy. That's the logic. Mm -hmm. And uh, so to my shame, I, I go to the meeting and afterwards, even my manager said, look, the client will respect you for the choice that you just made. Um, and the look on their faces didn't uh, evince that sort of respect and confidence. But even if it had, it's clear that I made a fool's bargain because I violated something more important for something less important. And what I learned from that has become um, a mantra for me, but also a, a driving insight for my research and work. And it's this, if you don't prioritize your life, someone else will. Yes. Uh, and that's really, you know, that, has, that idea has given me fire for the deed to research and then write essentialism and then all the work that's followed on. Yeah. But you had to have that experience, you know? I mean, I can tell from your writing and just seeing your face that it was one of those moments where you realized you had overstepped one of your own values. You know, like you felt it internally, like, oh, I kind of wanted to do it all. I wanted to do both of these things. But in the end, when I did try to do my work thing, it didn't feel right for me. So that gave you that information that you were going in a direction that wasn't aligned with your values. But I want to know how your wife reacted, you know, because, you know, I'm, I'm a woman, I have babies, and I just want to know what your wife said when you said you were going to go to this meeting. You know, the, what's interesting about that is I asked my wife just quite recently about this explicitly, and it was, this is in the middle of COVID, and I'd already decided before all of this crazy year that, uh, that I would launch a, a podcast. And, uh, and so I just always felt like the first podcast had to be with her. And so even with just no experience and terrible recording equipment and everything, we just sat down and we said, okay, let's talk about this. And so, of course, we talked about it before, but it was different to hear her actually putting into words in a spontaneous but still more formal moment uh, what it was from her point of view. And I mean, one of the things that she said about it was that she just didn't want to have to say it. Yeah. You know, she knows that if she had said, and she says, well, this is what she said. I'm not putting words in her mouth here. She said, I know if I had said clearly or even mentioned it at all, even the lightest mention, I would have stayed. It's not like, it's not like I was routinely uh, 
insensitive to any kind of request. Nevertheless, for her in that moment and in that predicament, and uh, you, you, you just don't want to have to. She didn't want to have to say it. Yeah. And I think that is reasonable, even, even at the same time as a slight aside, you know, of course, it's, it's good to be able to speak up and say, this is important to me. This is what I would hope to happen. But in that moment, she needed me to do it because it simply was obvious and clear. Uh, and so, of course, it is a violation to her, uh, it, it, you know. Um, and so for us, it's the journey going forward. And it, for everybody listening to the story, essentialism isn't a thing you do once. It's not one more thing you try and stuff into your overstuffed life. It's a way of, of living. It is a disciplined pursuit. And so really the test isn't just that one test for me that, you know, when I pull a McEwen and I fail in that moment, it's a test every day. Uh, what is the most important thing I can do today? And asking that every day and making sure you protect the time and the energy for the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. And that's why you specifically call it a discipline, because it does require discipline to constantly be, and we're talking about a little bit later, I'm going to ask you about editing because I love that concept. But before we get that far, who is the essentialism for? Like, who are you really targeting when you talk about essentialism? Is there a particularly you know, group of people? Is it career people, CEOs, or does essentialism apply to everybody? Uh, I wrote it in, in my heart, who I was writing it to is for someone who feels disempowered. Mm. So I didn't write it for the person who already feels empowered, already has, feels you know, strong, already feels clear, already feels like their voice is heard, uh, that people are responding to them. I, I was writing it for someone whose life currently feels like, well, stretched too thin mm -hmm. at work and at home, busy, but not necessarily productive, where their day feels constantly hijacked by other people's agenda for them. But that's who it's for. Um, I have worked with lots of companies, Apple, Google, Twitter, lots of companies and lots of executives. And so as a natural outgrowth of that, the book has quite a lot of business examples in it. Um, but that was just to illustrate the principle uh, it, to, to me. And if I was doing it all again, maybe I would adjust some of those stories to emphasize this is for every person. Mm -hmm. uh, this is for uh, someone who might be feeling just um, well, the way I just described a moment ago, that's who it's for. Yeah. And that's a big group of people. And especially in our society in today's world, there's a lot of people running around doing a million things, but feeling like they haven't done anything. And at the end of the day, not really satisfied with what they're spending their time on. So mm -hmm. I love the way that you describe that. Mm. One of the things you talk about is that we have to start with getting clear on what it is that we want to prioritize, what is essential to us. So how can we get more clear on that? Because I think that's one of the hardest things for me. Yes. The first thing, the very first thing is to create space to ask that question. And that's a non-trivial distinction between what you said and why I'm trying to clarify. Mm -hmm. Yes, the point of the space is to get clarity about what matters. But what I have experienced myself, uh, again, actually just recently in my life, is that only by creating space will that clarity come. Mm -hmm. If you are sleep deprived, for example, you're, we become bad at, like we don't know we're sleep deprived. And so we continue to be sleep deprived. When we get really busy, we, there are sometimes we don't really notice how busy we are. And so it produces more of the same behavior. We start getting reactive to all the incoming noise and, and then we're full of noise. So we start producing lots of activity in our lives, emailing people with barely a thought about it. We're reacting to the latest meeting, to the next Zoom conference, and it perpetuates the same cycle. Mm -hmm. So once you create space, so I just finished a new book. It's been sent to the publisher now, and it was about a month ago. And 
I was ready to jump into all the things I'd been pushing back on while I was in monk mode finishing this book up. And, uh, and, and Anna wisely said, look, I think, I think we probably ought to take a couple of weeks and just try and think and talk and plan and dream. And she's so right. And so I immediately started uncommitting from things and reset, you know, rescheduling things. And then, then the next thing I did, which I just have loved ever since, is I've just taken every block of time that's on my work calendar and blocked it out just so that there's space to do the things that Anna suggested. And so that's been about a month, and it's been such a liberating experience to just pause. Gaining this clarity I don't think is so hard. Clarity about what matters most isn't so hard if you have enough time to just relax and yeah. think about it and explore and talk about it. And in that space, you start to see and sense and feel this is the right direction. This is what you really ought to be doing and what, what, what you ought to be doing next. And so it makes you far, far more effective in every ounce of action you take. Because instead of it being reactive to stuff that could be completely pointless or, or, or certainly low-level importance, you're suddenly actually taking action on things that really matter and are disproportionately valuable. Mm. Well, thank you so much for making that distinction and clarifying that for me, because it's true. I feel like there's been times in my life where I'm literally in survival mode, just going from one thing to another, boom, 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 boom. And you're right. When you're in that mode, there is no space for thought. And so you feel like you have to go out and grab clarity. You have to go define clarity. But what you're saying is whenever you make this space, this openness, clarity comes for you. You just sit in the moment and allow the clarity to find you. And that sounds way better. <laughs> and way peaceful rather than yeah. being in like, ah, where, what am I supposed to be doing? And I'm trying to do all this stuff at once. So yes. that's a great distinction. Yes. And trying to be an essentialist in a non-essentialist way. Yeah. So where we try to take this new language and this new approach and we try to put it into uh, the hamster wheel of our life. Okay. I've got to really figure out what's really important. And, and it's like, well, actually, Essentialism isn't just about a what. Uh, it's also about how. That's particularly true now that, um, now that I've finished the research and writing of this next book. That's, that's really what I've just experienced over this last month and also what I feel is, is possible for us is to create a new lifestyle, a new way of being, a new approach to life. So you can't control what happens to you all sorts of things have happened to us in this year, uh, challenges of all sorts of kinds, personal, uh, you know, internationally and so on, it, that are beyond our control. But we can start to create and design a type of life that feels really different and actually is much easier but produces better results. That's, that's the value proposition um of, of 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 everything that i've been writing about uh former book and new book is that either you can go you can try less hard and still get better results better results without burning out uh because we're all so wound up we're working too hard we're Eat, sleep, Zoom is like this new, you know, part of this new normal for many people. And that they look at their Fitbit at the end of the day, and it's like 300 steps, you know. Seriously, it, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> because, because, you know, they only have to be able to go from wherever they work in the closet or the office at home to the, to the you know, refrigerator and the bathroom and back. I mean, that's it. They don't even have to get the car anymore. They don't. So, so there's a certain way of living that we, come to accept and we aren't aware that it's a, that we're making a choice 
that that's a strategy, that's a way to do things. There is a different way. Uh, and, and it's especially important to discover that alternative way of living in times of great stress and discombobulation and, uh, and, and hardship. It's especially important that, that you don't add to that burden by being reactive, stressed, working even harder, putting in even longer hours. It, you know, this, to me, is the, the, the promise and possibility of the of the work that I'm researching and writing about. I love that. But it's very contrary to the American way. So I feel like the American way is grit, hard work, you know, you don't sleep, you know, like you you just wear this like a badge of honor. And I think you talked about this in your book too, like we're going to have to change that mentality that things have to be hard for us to have a meaningful life. And I feel like even I have two kids. My sons are 10 and 15. My 15-year-old is a sophomore in high school and he's very bright and he's very capable and very talented. And we have lots of deep discussions and he's told me that he has that belief that he feels like in order to be successful it has to be a bit stressful. Like things have to be hard for him. And so I've been trying to change that belief. Like it doesn't necessarily have to be hard. Why does it have to be hard? So talk about this more of how it can be easier to do something better, because I think that that's contrary to what we're taught. Well, there is truth to work hard to get better results. Totally agree with that. Um, but that's not the same as saying, if you're not exhausted, you're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and that sometimes it has become, um, you know, you mentioned the badge of honor, and it's become more and more consuming as a certain kind of fatigue, a certain kind of sleep deprivation, a certain kind of perpetual 24-7 always on always hooked up, always feeling reactive, uh, that, that I think is enormously detrimental. And so I want to be at least one voice, one witness to say, look, if you are not working hard, um, you, you, should, you don't have to feel guilty. Some people really, literally, if they are not plugged in doing something, doing email. I mean, it doesn't even matter. They're just doing something. They, they have to be doing something. It could be social media. It could be something of very low value, but you have to be doing it all the time. And the second they're not, they feel guilty. I, I had somebody who I was teaching these ideas to who said, he said, Greg, you know, I, if I ate lunch, I felt guilty, which illustrates exactly the kind of problem. That is a, that's a good principle, working hard, a good principle gone too far, gone to the point of um, not only uh, re reduced compensation, but negative compensation. Yeah. You know, you, you've got, you're getting to the point where every hour extra you are plugged in and working, you're actually reducing your overall joy and success and insight to take you forward. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to find a rhythm of life that optimizes human performance, not factory performance, which is what many of the norms of work have actually been constructed around. Many of the norms of schools and work are factory-based approaches. So in a factory, you want to have it on, okay, if you can build a factory system that works 24-7, have people work in shifts, you can get a lot more throughput, you'll get more productivity. Uh, and, and that is one of the, I mean, that's been, it's true, Drucker, Peter Drucker is clear about this. He said, you're going to, you know, the, the Industrial Revolution achieved 50x productivity from the workforce. Mm -hmm. From before we had the agrarian age, then we had to between the agrarian age to industrial age, 50 times increase. That's how we were able to have this tremendous improvement in quality of life. Uh, agreed. Everything there, I think, is true. Every, I wouldn't fight with any of it, argue with any of it. And he then lays down the gauntlet. He says, he says the, in the knowledge age, we've got to, the, the challenge is going to be increasing productivity 50 times again. 
right? He, he said this uh, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, it's not happened yet. We haven't seen the same, the same kind of 50x increase in productivity. I think it's inevitable that we will. It's, it's completely obvious to me that we will. But you can't get there within the current paradigm. You've got to change the paradigm. And part of that paradigm is to not treat humans like machines. Yes. To not try to say, look, work tirelessly, crazy long hours all the time, every day, and you'll have breakthrough performance. You won't. You won't. You will burn yourself out. Then you'll burn out your most important relationships. Then you'll have even less discernment about which projects to take on out there. Your overall contribution, even in the out there work and career environment, will be less mm -hmm. if you treat yourself like a machine, like a factory. We're not. We're rhythm-based humans. We need to have times of total relaxation. But a lot of people now who I've talked to, and, and, and myself too, as I started this journey, who simply do not even know how to relax. Literally, they do not know how to do it. Therefore, they feel guilty. Therefore, you know, the best they could do is, okay, we've got to put on some television. And that's their only form of knowing how to do it. And they've got to learn how to relax, learn how to play again, learn how to sleep, learn how to take a nap. Discover the extraordinary breakthroughs that are capable if you completely unplug, if you take time away from all of these normal behaviors. This is some of the examples of what we will need to do in order to break through to a 50x productivity level. That's what, that's what I'm trying to figure out and help people with. Not a 0.2% per annum increase in productivity, but this huge breakthrough. You can't work 50 times harder. So if you want to increase dramatically quantum improvement in the results you get, you've got to work out of a new paradigm. And, and I'm trying in my own limited ways to put those things into words. I love that. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I was thinking before you even said, you know, we can't treat ourselves like we're machines. We're not, we're humans. And our brains don't do well with all of this multitasking and not sleeping and trying to do everything at once, we get diminishing returns is what you're saying. The more we try to push it, the returns just go down and down and down to the point where you are paying for it with your well-being. You're paying for it with depression and anxiety and chronic health problems because of all of the things that you're doing. How can we apply this concept to family life? In your book, you talk about this blurred line between work time and family time. And I've experienced that, especially now in the COVID time where it's so easy, like we've made it so easy to work from home. Like I can do telemedicine at home. I'm a physician, but I can do telemedicine at home. I can do all this stuff. And it seems like there's not a division anymore. There's not a clear line between, okay, I'm having meaningful time with my family and I'm working. So how can we apply these principles to get more meaning out of our time with our families? Yes, if, if you don't establish boundaries in today's environment, there won't be any. And what that means, although of course we, there is some, some bleeding in a COVID work from home environment where some of family bleeds into work. You know, there's for the first time the acknowledgement that, oh, there might be children in the house while you're on a conference call. And it's allowed now. It, it, there's there's an, at least the, I mean, it's just the tiniest acceptance of something. But at least there's, that's progress because it used to be if you're on a conference call, if you're, you're doing it from home, it's, you've just got to pretend there is nothing else but this conference call. So there has been a tiny bleeding over given this dramatic shift. Nevertheless, most of the bleeding takes place from work into life. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of eat, you know, sleep, eat, Zoom is actually from an article about the uh, founder and current CEO of Zoom. And he says, oh, yeah, all I do is eat, you know, do sleep, eat, Zoom. Um, and people relate to that. But then somebody challenges me, they go, well, actually, it's more like zoom eat sleep you know it's like this is what's consuming us so that's all to say 
if you don't create boundaries, there won't be any. And it will be almost entirely in favor of work consuming you, following you everywhere. And it's it's on your phone and it's literally in the bathroom with you. And it's it's I mean, it's just consumes you. So what are boundaries we can set? Uh, my favorite COVID boundary, uh, I was inspired by someone who is an essentialist, Ben Bergeron. Uh, I ended up, um, I was told about him. He's a CrossFit trainer. He works with like basically the fittest people in the world, these elite athletes. And I was told about him when I was on another podcast. And they said, they said, oh, you've got to talk to him. He talks about essentialism all the time. And one of the things he does is that he, he, he just walks out of every meeting at 525 at night so he can be home by six. And he just does this every day. And I was so inspired by it. Before I'd ever talked to him, I thought, I thought, well, I need to establish that same thing in COVID. And I chose five o'clock was my time. And I literally walk out the door and announce it to the house like a like a talking clock or you know something like that you know five it's 501 or it's 459 or it's five o'clock and i do it loud i do it to be a little bit funny but certainly to be accountable mm-hmm. and it's just this fun accountability every day because otherwise if you don't create such a point of accountability it's six o'clock seven o'clock eight o'clock. well why not nine o'clock why not ten why not eleven like wh- there's no natural time for it to turn off the internet never ends you know, technology never turns off on itself. You have to create that boundary. But once you do, I mean, it's, it is doable. You know, you can make a big step forward in progress. And, and certainly for me, I mean, our whole family knows, you know, and, and I know it, no matter what I'm doing, I will be out there uh, at, at five. And that's not some great achievement. It's just an evidence of, it's just a practical thing I think people can do even in this, uh, this crazy time of no boundaries. Yeah. But, you know, you talk about how it requires courage to do some of these things, courage to say no, to go against the grain, because it seems like everybody around us is not establishing boundaries. So if you're like the one person that tries to establish boundaries, people perk up and be like, oh, really? One of the things you talked about in your book was putting like a little email, like the vacation reminder all the time, but with a specific thing, I started doing that and I love it because it really allows me to relax and not feel like I have to check my email constantly. But I really haven't seen, besides what I read in your book, I've never seen anybody else do something like that. So talk about courage and learning how to establish these boundaries in our lives. Uh, Yeah, what I've learned about this, you, you don't want to be the only essentialist in your world if you can possibly help it. Uh, now, you, you might just, you, you might be in such a situation you just are, and as you feel like there's, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. But what I've seen has worked the best is where people, um, basically, they, if their first step isn't to start changing their behavior, uh, but is in fact introducing the language of essentialism to the people around them. It's like holding a book club is the first thing you do. And I'm telling you that that's that's exactly what I've seen in success story after success story that comes back to me when people say, oh, well, you know, this, I read essentially this is what I did. I got I got my I got my husband to read it. I got my wife to read it. I got my family. I got my team. I got my company. They, they get tons of people to read it. And that is so sensible because essentialism is more countercultural than I realized it was when I wrote it. Mm-hmm. So countercultural, I now would describe it as almost like the difference between uh, you know, English and, and, and French. Yeah. They're, they're, they're two different languages. Yeah. So essentialism is its own language. Non-essentialism, the dominant language, is its own language. Well, if you start speaking essentialism to a non-essentialist just directly, you're going to have real difficulties, and it's, the chance of being misunderstood is quite high. But if you can start to read it together, you introduce a new language, and now you can have conversations you literally couldn't have before. And, and that's where I would recommend it. I mean, just, just recently, un, uh, the CEO of Uncharted uh, has been in the news quite a bit because he read essentially, he had his whole team read it, whole company, and this was part of more research they were doing about creating a four-day work week. So they started an experiment to do that, and they brought in a, a, a company that helped them uh, to actually research and get the data of where they currently were at and and then to, to assess them at different points in this experiment. They talked to their partners and, uh, and, and customers and 
the, anyway, the, the short of it is, is that after several months of this experiment, they have now chosen to move to a four-day work week. So that's a pretty bold application of essentialism. But they are literally now getting done as much quality work in 32 hours as they were in 40 hours before. And their customers and partners have reported back that they see no drop in contribution. And yet they have now liberated, because they're still getting, everyone's getting paid 40 hours of work for 32 hours of work. They've just liberated everybody, no matter what their socioeconomic background or position, to suddenly have a whole extra day to try and balance out their life and to be able to to do the other things that make life possible and enjoyable and have a, a, a better lifestyle for themselves. To me, that's a big example, but at least having it as an example, it's a great case study of what essentialism can be if you don't try and do it just on your own, if you mm -hmm. get other people involved and you change the conversation. Yeah, community is so important. Having that support group and somebody else to practice with and to remind each other to keep integrating it into your lives. What about children? I am a pediatrician, so I see children from zero to 21. And Invariably, one of the things that I see as children get older, they start getting into sports, they have a million activities. So they're basically the poor kids, they're going to bed later than their parents because they have sports and activities, then they have to do homework, getting up early for swim practice in the morning, they're barely getting any sleep. How do we help our children and together too, because I'm sure it's both children and parents that are determining some of these activities, learn how to become essentialists? Uh, I, I think the, the first thing is to do just what we talked about with, uh, with, with, as an adult with your team, but doing it with your children. I think you can read essentialism together or at least share certain parts of it and to introduce the language and to teach those the idea of trade-offs. What trade-off are we going to make here? And, and start to build it into the family culture. Uh, it's not something you can dictate suddenly overnight. We're just now we're an essentialist family. No, but you can you can start introducing it even while other people and other families are carrying down a path of non-essentialism. You can start creating a unique and essential family culture, and it's a really beautiful thing as it as it comes together because you are investing more in e in each other's health, mental health, emotional health, spiritual health, physical health. You are investing a lot in each other's relationships because you're the most important people to each other. And so you, you start to push out the outside influences. Uh, and, and so th they start to experience this different way of living. With their own children, I, I've had times when even my, my so I have four children, uh, age now, age seven, uh, 11 to 17, and, but even when my when, when my son was, I would think I would think maybe eight or nine years old, we were talking about something, and he said to me, "Use the language of trade off." He said, "Oh yeah, that's just not the trade off I want to make." He could comprehend and use it not only to explain what it meant, but in a decision making environment. And that's what you want. What you want. What we want. What Anna and I want for our children is for them to be empowered to follow their essential mission in life and not to feel obligated actually to do anything else. And that doesn't mean be selfish. It means live a life of unique contribution. Live, live the highest usefulness that you can be to others. But that doesn't mean living out of FOMO about what everyone else is doing and the fear of missing out. It means finding that voice within that guides you you know, I mean, we've our children have been in public school. They did Spanish immersion for years and years. Um, finished that program, and then we decided, okay, we'll we'll do home education for one child for one year. And what that allowed us to do, and what it opened our eyes to, was frankly, was how many things in traditional school is there to support the system of school, yes. not the actual outcome for the development of, you know, in this case, our own children. Now, that might not be available to everyone, although, of course, it's available to a great many more people today than it was, you know, when we started this, uh, you know, years ago. Uh, but but let's rem the goal for us, at least, was remove all that noise. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what we found. I mean, just just be practical now. We found that 
I mean, first of all, you can graduate high school a lot earlier. That's what we found. Mm. Uh, you know, eldest uh, graduated two years early. Our next child just did it two years early. Um, and so they're, 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 I mean, they're at college now. They're working from home, but they're doing community college courses uh, starting at 16 instead of two years later. And uh, they're able to cope with it just fine. And it's, it's a happy thing. And it, it's just what's, what's happening is that if you can start to remove the undisciplined pursuit of more, if you can try and remove that sort of space to, to be and explore and figure out what really matters to them, they can start finding their unique voice, their unique mission. Uh, and and that, that's happened. And that, that none of them have the same kind of mission as I have or, or that Anna has. We don't, they, they're very unique. And that's what's possible when you're not putting them through a factory-based system. I mean, the schools... Excuse me, I'm not going off on this now, but the schools right. literally are built as factories. I mean, they follow a factory-based system. You divide subjects. You go to history here and science here and so on. I mean, there's no nat that doesn't have to be the case. You know, the world isn't divided that way. If you walk outside, you don't just have a physics world and a and a historical world and a I mean that's not the only way it's done. The ch children in school are in rows. Well, that's not what well, there's nothing about learning that it, it, it insists that that's how it must be done. Mm -hmm. That's just how you do it if you are trying to build an efficient system like a factory. Why do the children all have to learn in the same age group? It doesn't have to be done that way. That's not how learning happens in families. That's not le how learning happens in, uh, in business. <laughs> it's not how learning happens in Nonprofits. It's not learning how learning happens in religious institutions. I mean, it's actually a pretty unique thing that schools have set up in this way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not everybody's going to want to take the path I'm describing, but I just think that there's opportunities enormous once you start removing the the norms of how it has to be done. Yes. No. I love that. It's so beautiful, and you have so many. Great points there. I agree. I've always thought that school is, we have it a certain way because it allows us to teach a lot of kids at once. And that's the main reason. But it doesn't always serve children the best way because of that. Children learn in different ways as well. But and, I also and, they were, and they were built in the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. The mass public education system was built then. So it followed the norms of that time. And I mean, right now we are having this conversation at a time that challenges many of those assumptions. But even in this new time of, of mass virtual education, what many schools seem to be doing is to try to reproduce the experience they had in the classroom, where now it's even more removed from what really is required. So there's, I think there is an opportunity in this, a design opportunity, but uh, maybe we're beyond the, yeah. the scope of this conversation no. for today. No, I love that. I, that's really just awakening a part of my brain. I love thinking about that. But I want to go back to this point you made, which I think is just so beautiful in that you've realized that your children are all individuals <laughs> and <laughs> that, they, that they create hopes and dreams that are very personal to them. And I think that that's a very important key point because as parents sometimes, especially with parents that themselves are high achievers and we want that from our, for our children, we sometimes think that the more things that they do and the busier they are, the more opportunities that they will have later. But what you're saying is that it, it's worth it to sit down with your kids and talk about it. What is worth it to you right now? What do you have time for? What do you want to make time for instead of do everything and try every single activity and do every single class? Because that's kind of how I grew up thinking that I had to max everything out in order to get the success that I wanted to achieve. Yes. I mean, the, that presumption that more stuff will produce better output like more just purely more 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 stuff the schedule is full sleep less if you need to you know, that kind of approach starts very young and there's a movement in silicon valley there's a group um called uh, race to nowhere and it certainly that certainly uh, complements what i was trying to write about in essentialism where 
you, you have these these youth. I mean, th- their Palo Alto High School has had had at that time you know, something like you know, three or four suicides that year, you know, already. And and when you take that on an average, it's it's really high, um, uh, you know, high percentile uh, on a national average. And so it, this is a highly pressured way of doing school and life. But, you know, beyond the just the pure stress, exhaustion, you know, unhealthiness uh, that this approach, you know, produces, which includes, you know, greater, um, you know, cheating on tests. Because if you if you increase the pressure so high, and if you increase the amount of stuff to the point where it's really absolutely impossible to excel in the way you've been told you need to, that there is sort of this this natural increase of people saying, okay, well, the way we get through this is you share your notes with me, I share with you, we, you know, we, we do each other's homework, we do whatever to get through this, this obstacle that we've been given to get through. So in addition to that problem, this race to nowhere means that somebody gets to 30 years old and suddenly they, they're just lost. Yeah, they, they, they rush to get out of, to get the A's, to be able to get the SAT score, to get to college, to get the job that they were supposed to have. And then suddenly, all that hoop jumping has been done and they're lost. They do not know what to do and they do not know how to figure out what to do because they've never had to do it. Uh, what I think is absolutely possible and essential is to start that decision making and discussion process early. Yeah. We just this morning, so we, we just had a conversation just this morning with our children. It's been I don't know, probably 15, 20 minutes just on the question. Well, what, what are the goals? What are your long-term goals? Let's just talk about them. And let's write them down. And, and of course, we could have jumped in and written them for our children. Mm-hmm. And we would have mm-hmm. things to write down. There's certain things that are obvious to us. But that's not the goal. The goal isn't to have a list of written down. The goal isn't to have goals. The goal is to have them come up with goals, which is a different thing and takes more patience and takes uh, more of an ongoing process. But what they gain is a capability that to me, to Anna and I at least, seems to us to be the very point of parenting. The, the priority role is to help them to, discern, to be able to feel, recognize, and follow that conscience inside of them. If they can do that, our job is done. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean we suddenly disappear. It means we can move into a completely different role. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the role you want to play, which is a role of coach, a role of supporter, a role of uh, a cheerleader to be able to just help them as they, as they become adults and as they, you know, parents and grandparents themselves. And our, our role is different. We're not directing their life. They are being able to follow direction from inside. That to, that, that to me is really a thrilling approach to, to parenting and to leadership, I think, more generally. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes. I love it. That's so beautiful. I think now is a great time to talk about play, too, because you're describing some of these kids, and I can imagine their lives have very little play. The kids that are just like so pressured to get to a certain point by a certain date. Um, but play is really important in essentialism. Link these two together for me. Um, yeah, I mean, again, it comes back to this idea of of, of the rhythms of of human performance. Um, so we're most of us familiar with the idea that we have rhythm, rhythmic sleep, um, REM cycles, and ninety minute sleep cycles, and they're really important because you need uh, four per night, and if you if you if you only have three, then you you're really um, going to be fatigued okay so we're sort of familiar with that in the sleep area but but in our daily in um anders erickson's research he wanted to know whether those rhythms continue through the day uh and in fact he found that they do so we have 90 minute cycles through the day if we just ignore that again pretend we're sort of a machine then we'll we'll miss those cycles and we just kind of try and power through them we don't get renewed in the way we need to. So what we want is to have 90-minute work cycles and then a break. Go play, go relax, go, go, go explore. 
Uh, I mean, even if that's just a break through the first, maybe let's say you have three three of these cycles in the morning, you just take a little break between them. As you come into the, you know, the, I want to maximize the number of hours of play for myself and for my children. And I don't mean screen time. I mean, play time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, go out and, I mean, color, learn just for the sake of it. Uh, go out on the trampoline. Go, let's go play sports together or go play tennis together. Go on, the, on your bike, uh, you, you know. Play board games together. Just unplugged play uh, is is where so much of the development is actually taking place, mm-hmm. and that's so much of the recovery takes place there. And and same as we were talking at the beginning about relaxation, you know, relaxation is is a responsibility. <laughs> play is a responsibility. It's a discipline, and we've got to learn how to get great at it. Um, and so, so, so you know, the, I think of play as not, you know, just sort of a nice to have. I see it essential in and of itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and again, it's about if you had to summarize essentialism, it's really about taking control back around prioritizing our lives. It's it's, it's take responsibility for the prioritizing of your life. And as you take responsibility for that and you, you try to be more careful about what goes on your calendar and you try to be more careful about where you're using each unit of life and you actually create space, actually schedule it, schedule blank space of play time, schedule time to play as a family. We do it um, you know, in addition to other things, uh, you know, for sure, once a week, one evening a week, we're going to play together and be together and not be off just doing other things or not separate rooms on devices but that's what i think happens if you're not careful now yes. is that there's every every moment you're not doing you're just plugged in mm-hmm. oh yeah it's so easy in fact last year as a joke uh, when we took our family portraits at the last minute i told everybody to bring their devices yeah. so we were all dressed up in beautiful formal suits and ties and looked really nice <laughs> and then the last picture i said okay everybody get their device out and we all took a picture of us sitting in our nice, you know, in the forest, it's all beautiful, but everybody on their devices, because I felt like that's kind of, you know, like this, this big difference between being out and enjoying each other and looking nice and doing something together. But really, we're all attached to this technology, which can create a lot of interruptions in our togetherness. But yeah, I mean, that the play is so important in a lot for many different levels for our brains, for our well beings, but for our bodies too. getting our, our bodies moving. And you know, not all play is physically active. But I've spoken with an expert recently about the importance of play in our health, and the development of children and how they learn to problem solve, like they have to go out there, it's almost like practice for life, you know, you have to go out there and you got to do things. Yes, and and one of the one of the really lovely rituals uh, for, of COVID for for us, and and obviously people need to make their own, but it's just Anna and I will go for a walk for you know, pretty much an hour, and we don't do it quite every day, but but you know almost every day, uh, and that's play, and it is not an agenda. You're not you're not out there, and 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 you know don't we don't bring our phones, which maybe is. Well, probably not obvious, actually. People pretty much do go everywhere with their phones. But, but you know, you could bring your phone every day. You could take pictures as you're going. You could use it. for. I mean, you could still be plugged in. But it's so nice not to be. It's been one of the most pleasant parts of this experience. And it's one of the things that we definitely don't want to lose, you know, post this experience. Uh, just just. That type of it's 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 gentle. It's a fast walk. We go on a fast walk for the hour, so there is physical benefits for sure. There are, but it's when I combine them, it's like physical benefits, it's emotional benefits, it's social benefits. Uh, I think there's mental benefits, mental health benefits, and spiritual. Just being out in nature and being together, I think it's one of the most highly productive rituals of our life. Uh, and uh, and yet, what does it amount to? But it's but but a form of play. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Okay. So we make space 
We get clear on what's important. We start eliminating things from our lives that aren't important. But you talk about this concept of editing, which I love. So what is editing and how do we incorporate editing? Because you said that essentialism isn't just something you do once. Uh, yes. I mean, the, the idea of being the chief editing officer, you know, the CEO of your own life, um, but, but the chief editing officer of your life, I think is a, a vital role in a cultural environment that is so addicted to more. Uh, so if you lived in the agrarian age, there would still have been too many things to do. <laughs> it's not if we suddenly went back there, we, we don't want to we don't want to make the past somehow like it was it was all easy. I think in lots of ways, life is easier now than it was then. But we wouldn't have had the need to edit to the degree we have today by a huge margin. So there's still more things you can do, but there's not there's no notifications. There's no phone. There's no Internet. There's no the, the, all of this noise that's coming at us now. I don't want to be overly negative about those things because what actually I think they represent is success. Mm -hmm. That there's this tremendous success measured by the number of options and opportunities we have. They are, I mean, literally endless. Right? There's not even a billion things we could do. There, there it is is it's infinite, as one of my friends, uh, Cal Newport, says. It's infinite pools. Uh, the internet is like an infinite pool. Social media is infinite pool. There's no end to them. That is an evidence of success. We have to learn in our era how to be successful at success. I'm not, I'm not trying to put the internet back in a bottle. I'm not trying to say, oh, it was better when we only had three, three options in our life total. No, it's been tremendously valuable to increase the optionality uh, uh, available to humans. But just because it's, let's say, a first world problem doesn't make it less of a problem. Mm -hmm. We have got to develop skills that meet the challenge of now. So even over the last 10 years, let's just take that, forget industrial ages we've been talking about. Even if we say over the last 10 years, we've gone from being connected to hyper-connected. Uh, have our skills, you know, so this is the challenge. We had a response. Now the challenge changes, we become hyper-connected. Uh, so social media becomes more and more integrated into, into our lives. Have we developed a new set of skills to deal with that so that we can again have success? We have to learn how to become successful at success or the success around us, all these optionality will just totally overwhelm us. Yes. Consumers make us sick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's literally what's happening. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. This is the anxiety explosion. This is, uh, this is the, the, you know, suddenly decision fatigue is something that, you know, people of almost every age experience and, and struggle with uh, exhaustion, uh, mental and physical exhaustion increasing, uh, sleep deprivation increasing. These, these are natural consequences of success uh, of all this stuff if we don't become more selective. Yes. And so editing, chief editing officer of our life means that you, you, you become, you know, as I was describing over this last month, every request, everything I think I'm going to say yes to, instead of yes, put it on the calendar. You know, and I have an assistant. And so it's very easy to get more stuff on your calendar. And somebody requests, oh yeah, just put it on. Well, over the last month, I've again, almost discovered essentialism again and become an essentialist more you know, again in my life. And I go, every request, you think about it. And when you say yes to it, you mean it. And I know why it's on the calendar. And I know what my intent is. And it's a very different feeling and way of living. And who can take responsibility for that but each of us? Mm -hmm. You can't outsource that to somebody else entirely. Eventually, you still have to be the editor, the person who decides, does it come and does it go? It's not selfish. I have an editor for the book that I just did. She's not selfish when she edits out a story or a, a chapter or a section. I don't think, my goodness, why is she doing that? I know it's in service of a better, a better book. Yes. In a similar way, we edit not because we're selfish, but because we want to create a better, a better life contribution, a better life story to continue exactly. that. Exactly. Yes, editing is the most important part. I learned that. I have a book. 
definitely not as successful as yours, but <laughs> I, I think I'm an author. Thank you. Congratulations. But you know, well you realize when you write a book how important editing is. Like it, your words, it, it just becomes so much more powerful. Do you have a formalized way besides every request, everything that you're going to put in a calendar, you're going to be thoughtful about it. But do you sit down like every quarter, every month to kind of just look over everything? Is there like a formal process you go by? Uh, yeah, I've tried lots of things. Um, one of the things that I love to do is, um, is a personal offsite. For sure, every six months, uh, I will do a two days, you know, you just get, get off certainly traditional technology. I've got my journal, I've got my planner. Uh, in fact, I'm just designing uh, a, a new uh, planner mm. uh, that, uh, that I, that, um, I, think it, I think I'll just at first at least provide it for free, maybe for those that, that, uh, that buy the new book. But, uh, but over that, after that, I think I might keep it going because as I've started using it myself, I found it very powerful to turn these things into an actual daily ritual, weekly planning ritual, quarterly planning process. And so it's, it's more developed than I can summarize in, in, in you know, 30 seconds. But, uh, but I think having a cadence of reflection and designing is a very high leverage activity. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if, you, if you're creating space, uh, so as I say, every six months, taking two days, and it's just reassessing it's not even just planning it's it's really getting deep uh, there's a conference that uh, uh the church i attend does every two every six months and so i use that two days to really get centered uh in in the highest level of light that that, that, that i know how to access and so then you're sort of simultaneously setting goals and evaluating your life and it's so it's not just okay what am i going to do today and this week it's just what direction am I headed in? Who am I trying to become? Yeah. Uh, and, and that changes your prioritization. And so then I, I found very, this was just this last weekend, and I found it uh, very um, energizing to come into this week, uh, prioritizing each day, coming full circle to the question we began on. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the most important thing I can do today? Changes based upon the level of light that you're accessing. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you're more inspired, then you have a better answer to that question. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Definitely getting that big picture view. And I love the concept of editing because even when it comes to habits and behaviors, I talk to my clients about, you know, every season's different. The world around you is changing. The produce is changing. You, you're, you know, it might be like your kids are a different grade now. So you have to do things a little bit differently. So you do have to go back to the drawing board and reassess. Is it working for you or not? What do you wish people knew? Um, oh, if, I could, if I could help people the whole world over know one thing, and I would want it myself, it's to really be able to uh, discern the light. Uh, in their own life, and to and to be able to follow it, to really be able to listen, you know, it's obviously not with your ears, right? It's to listen with your heart. Um, that ability, I think, is the most important ability in the world today. And I think without it, in the, you know, let's say the coming decade, uh, we're just going to be totally discombobulated without it. Mm -hmm. The noise level is already so high. But it's not like we haven't peaked. The noise level will, it will begets itself. Mm -hmm. So the louder the world becomes, the louder it will become. Yeah. Because people will shout louder in order to be heard, to be able to get through the media. They think they have to scream louder and be more obnoxious or be more uh, volatile or be more shocking. And, and so this will, this will increase. And so as the technology also increases. And so if we don't learn how to listen, I know it's a little mixed metaphor, but to listen to the light, <laughs> um, then, then our own lives will be massively disadvantaged. Uh, our relationships hugely uh, challenged. Yeah. Uh, and we already see lots of that evidence already, but I think it's, we're on a much steeper curve, exponential curve. Uh, for a variety of reasons over the next 10, 20 years. 
Uh, and, and so even already people talk to me about, yes, I spend time with my loved ones, but I'm never present. Mm -hmm. They never feel present. They're always either on their phones or thinking about their phones. And, and on their phones, it just, it's just full of junk media, junk news, junk, uh, it, it just gossipy news. That's what I mean when I say that. So much noise mm -hmm. uh, that, that clouds us and makes it hard to, to, to discern that light. That's what I would want uh, people to know. I love that. What personal habit are you most proud of? How did you develop it and how do you maintain it? Yeah, I, I wasn't sure quite what I was going to say to this question. Um, but now, now that we're here, it's what I just talked about. I still want it more myself. It's an ongoing process. I think you grow into the principle of, of discerning this light. Uh, but that would be the one that I'm most proud of, even as I recognize many more layers to the principle and, 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 and something I would want to become even stronger in. Uh, but, but that process, I mean, it includes for me um, all sorts of routines that have been established. I've talked about some of them already. Uh, asking personal quarterly offsite, mm -hmm. um, building in a weekly meditation and reflection, mm -hmm. not just meditation in the way we normally talk about it, but like really reflecting on something, on the highest principles of your life, mm -hmm. uh, on the highest uh, revelatory moments that you've had, uh, you know, reading your life plan uh, frequently, uh, planning weekly, uh, writing out once a week, f you know, full like what are the, the most grateful, the things you're most grateful for, where you've seen uh, clearest this week and, and capturing those things, writing a journal. I've barely missed a day of writing a journal in 10 years now. Uh, and, and that process and rereading them later, um, uh, spending, I would say at least half an hour every day, uh, just in council with, uh, as a family, mm -hmm. just talking together, um, uh, praying. Uh, th these are all practices, and, and I could go on because what I'm really talking about, it's just as with any integrated strategy, you must reinforce that strategy in a variety of ways, layer upon layer, day after day, as you, as you strengthen a particular approach to business, or in this case, to life. And, uh, and so this has been a focus point now, personally, for I don't know, I suppose personally for 35 years or something now and, and as, a, as a family for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And that literally has been the focus day after day. And of course, you, 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 don't, you make mistakes all the time, but that has been the focal point and to keep coming back to it. Yes. No, thank you so much for being authentic and, you know, being humble about it, saying you're not perfect. You have to have these systems in place in order to continue to live that sort of lifestyle because so easy to veer off and get pulled into another direction. So even you, the writer, the creator of essentialism has to have these systems in place. Well, yeah. And actually, actually that I know that we're, we're, we're here, but that's really the primary additional thing I want to say about essentialism is at the beginning, you'd said, of course, because it's right in the book uh, that yes, it's a disciplined pursuit and it is. But here's a distinction that, that I make in the book, but I don't think people heard, and I want to make it more clearly now in, in writing, is that you need to build a system that produces discipline, not just be disciplined. And that's a really different thing. Uh, I just had on a Jordan Arbinger on the, on the podcast, and, and he went through his system for, uh, for networking. And it's not just habits, it's a system. He, has a, he uses an actual tool and it's built in there. And he has programmed a giving, generous networking system. And that's so smart because on a day that he feels maybe self-interested, maybe he feels self-interested every day, I don't know, but his system is giving system. So on the days he's felt like most giving, he's constructed the system that then reinforces that for him. Similarly, in my own life, there are days when I'm off track, but I have wanted on the days I'm on track and in attunement to build systems that reinforce living in attunement in perpetuity. 
Yes. No, thank you for making that distinction. That's very important because I think in my head, I'm thinking there's people that are naturally essentialists and people that are non-essentialists and you just have to try to be an essentialist. But what you're saying is you have to build it. You have to build it into your life. You have to build it into the steps that you take and that's how you follow the path. And that, that really is very helpful to see it that way, because that means that all of us could be that. We don't have to just naturally be inclined to that. This has been so so helpful. And I know that a lot of people are going to be inspired by this conversation. So please tell us where we can connect with you, where we can find your book. Can you tell us a little sneak peek about what your next book is about yet? And what products and services do you offer? Um, I think everything, just about everything you just asked is just go to essentialism.com. There's, there's, uh, there's already new resources, and there'll be more uh, that that are you know right close to being announced. Um, uh, there's a one minute Wednesday, which is just a weekly uh, newsletter. In one minute, you can get kind of a week's reminder of some element of essentialism you can put into practice. Uh, that's on there, and 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 that's a fairly recent development. There's the podcast I've mentioned. Uh, that's a weekly you know, intervention with people and interviews to, again, learn and keep this living. Um, there's an essential planner that isn't announced. This is like probably the first time I'm talking about it. But uh, but I, I'm so excited about developing that. Um, you know, and I think that's going to be it. The book doesn't come out until April. Um, it's uh, uh, I mean, the book is called uh, Effortless. Uh, and. It's really devoted to a single principle, which I think is a very humane principle, which is that not everything has to be so hard. Oh, I need this uh, book right now. Okay, definitely. <laughs> I'm going to be ordering this book and probably reading it a few times. <laughs> well, I, I, I appreciate that response and that feeling. It's, the subtitle is actually just make it easy to do what matters. Oh, I love that. Uh, but, it's, uh, but really the heart, the heart behind it is, is that in so many ways – we make and other people make life for us sometimes harder than it needs to be. Mm. And we believe if it's not hard, we're doing something wrong. And of course there are hard times. I write at the end of the book about an exceedingly hard time uh, in our family life. Um, But even in the hardest times, and maybe especially in the hardest times, we have to learn whether to make it harder whether we can make it easier yes. and there is an easier lighter uh, way to do life and it is good oh oh i cannot wait that's lovely thank you so much this has been amazing thank you for your time and i'm so honored because i know that you pick and choose what you do very carefully so i really appreciate you giving me your time and being generous with it Leave us with one call to action before we say goodbye. What is one thing that my listeners can start doing today to improve their lives? I think that if they simply write down the question, what is the the most important thing I need to do today? Just write it somewhere and put it up where they see it every day. The question stays the same, but the answers change. Uh, and uh, just just today, uh, it's going to. I'm just writing about it. It will come out today on the one minute tomorrow on the one minute Wednesday. But um, it is a story of uh, jo- Joanna Davy in the UK who started asking that every day. At first, she just had career answers come to her. But one day, her dad calls up, says, "Look, Mum's in the hospital, but don't bother coming because it's it's nothing serious, and and you've got so much on your plate. Don't worry about it." But um, but because she was ans- asking this question every day when she asked it, she said, I remember where I was. I remember what I was doing, the weather outside, everything exactly. And I knew clearly I, the most important thing is to travel two hours. So it's no small commitment, two hours to the hospital to be with my mom for something that I've just been told is not a big deal. She goes, she spends time talking to her. She says, look, I love you, mom. Uh, mom says the same back to her. I love you too. Within an hour, she slipped into a coma. Within a week, she had died. And she just said to me, when she was talking about this, she just said, what? Think of how different it would be if I hadn't been an essentialist in my life. And that's why that question is so powerful. You ask it, but as you develop, as you mature, as you gain greater light, as you gain greater 
insight, even revelation, you will see what matters yeah. from the many other competing activities in our lives. Oh, I love it. Thank you so much for your time today. Greg McEwen, author of Essentialism and new book coming out 2021, Effortless. Oh, it's going to be amazing. Will revolutionize my life. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 from, from, your, from your lips to God's ears. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I Thank usually you. say have a plantastic day, but I'm going to tell you to have a very essentialist day. I love it. Thank you. And bye-bye. Hey, veggie lover. I hope that you loved today's episode. Will you take a second and do me a huge favor? Please subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode. You're the reason I'm here and I want to share it all with you. Thank you for listening and have a plantastic day.